Welcome to our Ayn Rand Center series on the psychology of the characters of the Fountainhead, or I should clarify the major characters uh, who we're discussing currently. And today we're going to be looking at, I think, the character who, for me, I feel almost the most sadness when I connect to, along with, along with uh, Katie, who we'll come to at another time, but I find one of the major characters of this novel um, even just saying it now, I, I'm, I'm, I have a real sense of heaviness and sadness in, in what could have been, and and what what does and what does come to be at the end of the book. And um, I think, and I'm delighted to be joined today by Drs. Andrew Bernstein and Dr. Gina Gorlin. And um, I'm really looking forward to your insight, expertise, and just riffing and discussing this great character of literature. And um, this time, over to you, Andy. What, do, what does you know, Gail represent to you? Well, I love Gail Wine, and um, there's so many good things about him. And of course, there's some huge negative things too. But he's the one, he's the great tragic hero of the, uh, of the Fountainhead. And I've, I've long thought, and I might write an essay on this one day, that Gail Wynand is as great a, tra uh, the story of Gail Wynand is as great a tragedy as has ever been written. You know, uh, I, I would equate it, I would equate it with the tragic works of Sophocles, you know, about Oedipus and the tragic works of Shakespeare, Macbeth and Hamlet uh, and, and Othello. I think the tragedy of Gail Wynand is at that same level, perhaps even greater. And what's extraordinary about it is that it's it's a it's a secondary character in a story that's fundamentally about somebody else. I mean, Ayn Rand's literary achievement here is just it, it, it's just remarkable. But um, Wynand, in in a, in a book that focuses on uh, independence, cognitive and psychological independence versus dependence, well, how Ayn Rand uh, brilliantly stated the theme that it was individualism versus collectivism, not in politics but in men's souls. Uh, Wine, Wynand is the mixed case. Right? Most of the other major characters, they're either fundamentally independent or fundamentally dependent uh, on, on, on society for their judgment. Wynand is the mixed case. And of course, it's the, it's the dependent part of him that ultimately destroys him. And I think, I think you can at least make a case that the, the psychological uh, dependency part, the second-handedness, is maybe an honest error because he grows up in the harsh slums of Hell's Kitchen, you know, this, this real tough neighborhood on the west, on the, on the, the Hudson River docks in New York, in New York City. Uh, and it was a really, you know, tough neighborhood, you know, I'm tough, probably not the wrong word, crime ridden neighborhood, uh, late, you know, late 19th turn of the 20th century when, when wine is growing up. And, uh, you know, he's, uh, he, he, every every attempt he makes, he's, he's a brilliant kid. He's a brilliant young man. Every attempt he makes to uh, to uh, implement some of his inno innovative ideas is met with disdain from uh, anybody. Anybody's working for. Shut up, kid. You don't run things around here. You know he. You know he he hears that. So he he arrives at the, the mistaken conclusion that the only way the independent thinkers can. Um, can make any any headway in a world run by conformists, you know, and people who just uh, do what they're told or do it do what's expected of them or give to society what society wants. The only way that the independent thinkers can get things done and make progress is to gain power over their over their fellow man, and that's that's what he he sets out to do, and. You know, in, in his newspaper, the Banner, which is enormously popular and 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 makes him wealthy and gives him a a powerful voice, uh, makes him wealthy, gives him political influence. Uh, he's, I mean, not not only with his wealth, where he can he can choose to donate to political campaigns or not, but his readers. He's got millions of readers, has millions of voters, and so you know he's got politicians, uh, you know, kissing up to him because of his power. He's got this 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 power, but. The paper isn't his. The paper belongs. The values in the paper belong to the, you know, the lowest common denominator in society. I mean, the banner. If somebody cures cancer, and on the same day somebody in the Bronx, you know, murders a, uh, an axe murderer, or kills his wife and his and, and his six kids with an axe, it's the axe murderer that's going to be on the front page of the banner, and the cure for cancer will be relegated to you know page six, you know, or 
or whatever. It's not his values in the paper. The paper doesn't belong to him. And we see his values, you know, in his private art gallery, his love for Rourke, his love for Dominique, his love for Rourke's buildings. We see his first-handed judgment, his impeccable, exquisite first-handed judgment. A tragedy of Weiner's life is that doesn't rule his paper until it's too late. But it's it's too. I guess we could discuss that as we as we go along. But it's much later in the story that his values come to rule the newspaper, and it, and it's too late because, you know, his his defense of a noble ideal. You know, Rock and Rock's buildings. He, his, his audience doesn't has no regard for a, a noble ideal, and the people do have a regard for a noble ideal. Have long since stopped taking wine seriously. So, uh, I guess we we can we I guess we can go on. I don't want to I don't want to cut into Gina's time, but but, but I was, he's a great tragic hero. Because what I was gonna I was gonna ask Gina next was um, you know, why do, Gina? I was gonna say Gina, why do you think I'm so sad? Even just bringing up wine and and. And he's just kind of summed it all up, you know, it's this great tragedy. And, um, but I'm wondering what, what this bringing up for you, Gina, just yeah, I'm, going there. I'm very much with you. I probably shed the most tears for Wine End when I read and reread The Fountainhead. And Andy summed it up really well. I guess from a psychological angle, I see Wine End as he, wrongly concluded based on some really disappointing interactions. First of all, as you're describing Andy, he grew up in a world where it was kind of dog eat dog, every you know, armed teenager for him or herself, and that you either have to beat up the the bully or get beaten up. And so, so that generally colored his worldview from early on. But I think what really did him in psychologically was the lack of integrity that he observed in people that he initially had a lot of hope for, where he thought that he had finally found, I don't know if you guys, well, I'm sure you remember better than I do, and you know this book so well, but when he, briefly he describes a, a love that you know, where he had fallen for a girl that he barely knew, but he thought that he saw all of this depth and intelligence and idealism in her. She was soft-spoken and seemed to you know, bear herself in this proud way. And then when she actually opened her mouth to speak, she was this shallow, mindless person. Andy, do you remember the line? It's something like, do you, you think I'm cuter you than Ashley or something? And you think I'm, you really think I'm prettier than whoever it is? Yeah, that was, that was what she had. Yeah, so that's, what, you so that's what she had to show for herself. Yeah, and then, and similarly, you know, when he was first trying to kind of make it in journalism and he got really outraged about one of the many, you know, cases of corruption that he uh, ran up against as he was doing odd jobs and rising. Um, and he wrote a piece uh, unveiling or you know, an expose of the corruption and he went to who he thought was going to be this really like you know first-handed and high in integrity um publisher and basically got booted out didn't even get a hearing and at some point concluded that integrity is a lie that there is no integrity in this world and that when whenever he gets his hopes up in effect he's just going to get them shattered and he, in a way, went on a quest to prove it to himself, right? That he, that his, his major weapon was to destroy people's integrity or his major, his MO, right? That everybody knew, why everybody knew to fear him largely was because he, he used his power to crush people who, you know, the starving artists who claimed that they would never sell themselves out, you know, for a buck. And then he would, make them an offer that they couldn't refuse, right? He basically showed everyone to be a whore <laughs> in, in the realm of whatever they allegedly had principles. And so, so in concluding, in reaching the cynical conclusion that the integrity, virtue, idealism is a lie, that it doesn't exist in the world, and it's therefore you know, for him to try to exemplify it as futile and it's just going to get him crushed. He concluded that there were two options to either rule or be ruled, right? As you were saying, Andy. So either, either to be under the heel of all these people who 
are telling him he doesn't run things around here or to run things. And what he thought that that meant was, well, I need to run them. I need to, uh, I need to be able to call the shots. I need to be able to break them so that they don't break me. And and since he assumed, you know, that everyone, including himself, is ultimately breakable, he sort of, uh, he broke himself, fundamentally, right? And so I think the tragedy, and the tragedy is, again, just like with Dominique, he, he was using his own judgment, and he acted, and this is arguably, you know, again, there's no fact of the matter, except insofar as Rand had some conception that, uh, that she for which she plants clues in the novel. And I don't think she was thinking along lines of like, is he an evader or is he being intellectually honest? So I don't think there's really a way to rule on that question. But I think the way she portrays him is that he, he's someone who never ceases to see with his own eyes. He's a first handed soul. He is, he was, how does work put it? Like he wasn't born to be a second hander. And he, what he means by that, I don't think Rand at that point thought anybody's born innately you know, virtuous or not, or innately independent or not. I think what she meant by that is that in his soul, fundamentally, he's still a self, right? He's, he sees with his own eyes and he's acting on an intention that he reached through his own independent judgment, but he's just so fatally wrong, right? And what he doesn't understand and doesn't know until he meets Rourke and kind of sees the you know, events of the novel play out. He doesn't know that Rourke's exist. <laughs> he doesn't know that it's possible. He doesn't know. And, and he thinks Rourke is breakable, right? When he meets him, almost the first thing he does is he tries to break him the way he tries to break everybody. And of course, the way that this, this has played out in every other instance in his life was that the artist caved and, and drew his hideous conventional version of a house for him in exchange for you know not having their career destroyed or whatever Wynan was threatening and Rourke just laughs in his face right it has his machinations his power grab has no power over Rourke because Rourke sees through him because you know th there's a meeting of the minds like Wynan has never experienced before and Rourke just doesn't budge and he doesn't buy it and he says really is this what you he, he actually draws the hideous house that he, you know, imagines Wynan, Wynan to be asking for him. He says, is this what you want? Right? And then Wynan is completely powerless before him because it's so clear that this is not, you know, that this would be a selling out and that, that the man in front of him, the real Rourke that, that he thought was going to just, you know, kind of burst into little flakes is for real. Right. So, and I think part of what's so sad is the loneliness of never having met a Rourke until it was too late. Right. And, and Rourke's, Rourke says to him, I had an ally here. And one says, what, your integrity? And Rourke says, yours, yours, Gail. And, yeah. and of course, Rourke, Rourke is right. And it's so, it's part of the tragedy and the brilliance of Ayn Rand's writing that uh, the, the, the man that Rourke, so several points. First of all, uh, Wynan hires Rourke to build a fortress to protect Dominique, right? And in hiring Rourke, he's hiring the only person in the whole world that he has that that he has to that protect. He has to protect. Rourke, which you right. know, that's the, the dramatic irony. Yeah, yeah, it's a brilliant part of the love triangle, the love, the love story. But also, deep, even deeper than that, the man that that Wynand will love Rourke, the only one he could love, his soulmate, they're not even, they're, they're brothers, they're soulmates, uh, is the man who's gonna destroy him. Uh, because you're right, G, I mean, you put it nicely. He spent his whole life proving to himself that there were no men of integrity. The only way this, we have this fundamental choice that, that we have to make. We can choose uh, a noble failure or, you know, ignoble success. And that's the only choice. And so he chose ignoble success. And he spent a lifetime proving that there were no men of integrity, that every, every man has his price. And if pushed far enough, they'll choose ignoble success rather than noble failure. And the, the, man, who, the man who won't make that choice is the one who will break him because it'll, it'll right. show him 
that his choice, the, the, setting up that choice was fundamentally wrong. And the choice he made to sell his soul for commercial success was wrong. This is what, at Rourke's trial, at the Cortland Dynamite, when verdict is being pronounced on Rourke, and, and Rourke gets up to face the verdict, Winning gets up at the back of the at the back of the room. This is a scene only Ayn Rand could have written, um, because verdict is being pronounced on on Wynan as well as Rourke, and it's an inverse proportion to the to yeah. the verdict on Rourke. It's so if Rourke, yeah. yeah, if Rourke is acquitted, it shows that men have been wrong all along. Yeah, exactly. It shows that men of integrity and men of independence can succeed in this world and succeed on on their own terms. So if Rourke is acquitted. Wine is convicted. And conversely, if Rock is convicted, then it shows that Wine was right. There are no men, uh, men of independence and integrity yeah. cannot achieve commercial success. And Wine was right. I sold my soul, but it was the only way, it was the only way to go, it was the only way to gain commercial success. So, the, 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 so the but I think, yeah. This but is this yeah. is inverse, you know, for, you know, if, if Rock is acquitted, Wynan is guilty. If Rock is guilty, Wynan is acquitted. Either way, Iron Man set it up so that the hero was going to take a blow. He's either going to prison, Rock's either going to prison, or he's going to lose. You know, he's going to destroy his soulmate brother. Either way, Rock's going to have to take a, a blow. And Iron Man said, I think in the fiction writing course, make it as hard as you can for your hero. <laughs> well, well, she sure did. So. Yeah. 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 No, I think what fundamentally acquits Wynand for me in the sense that he's a tragic hero rather than an antagonist is that he doesn't want to be right, right? He, he, he wants to be wrong. And of course there's this tension within him because, and Rourke keeps kind of calling him out on it gently or, or sometimes even without meaning to. Sometimes Rourke would rather let Wynand stay blissfully ignorant of you know, the massive error that he's made but he but he knows that wine and almost in spite of himself ends up supporting Rourke and really coming to his side because he wants to be wrong about the really cynical conclusion that he's reached right and at the beginning of the novel or not the novel but when we first meet wine and you know, directly in person so to speak he's contemplating suicide right he's playing with a gun and he almost, he's so indifferent. He, it doesn't even matter to him whether or not he pulls the trigger because he's living in a world that for all he knows has no real virtue and no real heroism in it. And he's kind of living his best version of a life in such a world, but it's not much of a life. And he comes alive when he meets Rourke. And, you know, and the whole, when the whole trio kind of gets together and yeah. when he discovers that people like work and Dominique exist. Yeah, there's and no, there's no value. This brings... So no, no major Sorry. values in his life. Otherwise he'd want right. to live. He wouldn't have a, a right. sense of indifference. And you're right. When he meets Dominique, when he meets Rourke, now, you know, the, it, it energizes the, you know, the, 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 the best within uh, wine. And now he's got, now he's got things to live for. And this, this brings me to my next question that I wanted to put to the two of you. You know, I've, I've been listening to, like, you know, this very flawed, tragic character. But I think it's important to look at his values as well, his value as well to Rourke. Why, why you know, we, we've, you've been discussing why, you know, he opened up Rourke. Rourke opened him up and gave him a reason to live. But why did Wyman give Rourke? What, what's their value? You know, they clearly love each other. You know, it's, it's an incredible, you know, in modern vulgar terms, bromance. You know, <laughs> it, it really is though. Yeah. It's a very yeah. deep and it's real true. version of that. Yeah. And it's a very Absolutely. powerful one. And, and it really affected me when I first read it, you know, and I, and yeah. I, lo I loved, you know, I loved watching, watching, you know, in my head, watching the two of them together and, you know, yeah. imagining what they, what they would have been talking about and what they did together and, and, and stuff. But yeah, what is yeah. the value that wine and brought to Rourke's life. I think it's so, important to, to acknowledge that. Yeah, I think yeah, on, what's what's so incredibly rich about the contrast that she sets up is we are led to understand that wine and Rourke started out the same, right? That there's something so deeply similar about them that 
they provide each other with a unique visibility that neither of them gets from anybody else, including Dominique, right? The two of them clearly, like there's something unique, there's a unique kind of, yeah, brotherhood. And I think part of what we see is that, you know, you know how they, especially Wynan is asking work about his childhood and about, you know, did he experience this, 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 and mostly he's getting yeses, you know, were there stops along the way? And did you experience, you know, was it like, did you do these odd jobs in these ways? And did, did you always end up being the best at them? And, you know, like there were all these little experiences that they shared by virtue of, I think, being really brilliant and really visionary humans, you know, that, that the two of them, like clearly that they have a kind of soul connection. And, and I think there's probably an ambitiousness and an independence and uh, just like an expansiveness of mind that the two of them share on an unrivaled scale, at least, you know, out of everyone that we meet in the novel. And at the same time, I, I think this is where we see the power of, you know, free will and of self-determination that there's a point in their development where they diverge. And we see it when Wynand asks Rourke, you know, at some point he asks like, and did you resent them? You know, did, did you kind of swear to you? I don't remember, Andy, you'll probably remember this better, but like, did you swear to yourself that you won't let them rule you, that you'll be the one on top and Rourke kind of, that's the first time that why didn't say something that's just sort of alien to Rourke? And he's, no, I didn't really care. I did my thing, right? Like I, people weren't ever that psychologically important to me. I just, you know, I tried to do my work my way and, and I uh, focused on commanding nature and yet Wynand, he focused on commanding men, right? And that's where they diverged. But at the same time, fundamentally like that, profundity, you know, that brilliance and that clarity of vision and that grandeur of soul is something that they both still equally share. And Rourke's never gotten visibility on it to that degree. So I think for Rourke, it's this unique source of visibility and, you know, like-mindedness that's really precious to him. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely right, Gina. I, I think, I think second only to Rock himself in this story, Wynand is the most creative person for all his flaws. Yeah. And there are other creative people too. Roger Enright, you know, is is a, is a good example. Steve Mallory is a good example. But Wynand has this creative life force, and he's the one. Uh, that created this, this journalistic and real estate empire. He's the one who created the band. Tui, Tui can't do it, Tui can destroy it, but it takes, it takes Wynan to create it. And, 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 and this is, I think, what Rourke responds to. And it's what Dominique responds to also, because you know when, when they're making love for the first time and, and for Dominique, you know, he loves her. She doesn't, she doesn't love him at that point although she comes to and she and, and she's trying not to respond to wine and like she you know she didn't respond in bed you know to Keating that wasn't that wasn't difficult she had no response to him but wine and says to her you know it won't do Dominique you know and you know she has to she she just emotionally she responds because the feeling is like is that he, he has it the life force the the creativity this man has it that is what what I what I love about Rock he has a great deal of it. He, Rourke is in its pure, you know, and uh, you know, distilled form. It's undiluted form. Wine in his mix, but he has a great deal of it. And Dominique responds to him, you know, in uh, in the lovemaking. It's that it's that it's that creative force that both of them uh, respond to in wine and then love, even th despite his serious moral flaws. I mean, some of the things he does to innocent people, like white costs. Yeah, he's really bad. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think really we need bad. to remember, like we're fawning yeah. over him and, you know, yeah, we really sympathize. Bad. He's yeah. a murderer, like he's a mass murderer, right? He's like, he yeah, is directly, spiritual. Yeah, right. and not just spiritual. I mean, he's like, he's killed people. Well, both. he didn't kill them. They committed suicide because of what he did to them. But yeah, close enough. He close ordered, enough. Close enough. I'm pretty, like, I think there are some like, Close assassinations. He's borderline. He's borderline. Directly tied to him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. He's he's a, he does really bad things. So no doubt about it. Why do, why does yeah. Rourke allow? Why does Rourke engage with someone who does really bad things? He values the visibility, and I think that to, again, like for Rourke as a not so, 
Rand uses the term you know, social metaphysics. And I think Wynand, he became a social metaphysician in a, in a way that Dominique also starts out and then learns because Dominique, because the way Dominique's error plays out doesn't lead to the actual, like the existential damage that Wynand's error leads to, right? Where he actually does a whole bunch of really evil things that lead to the destruction of lives on a massive scale, right? Whereas Dominique is doing it in a more kind of private way and kind of figuring things out as she goes, but both of them are social metaphysicians in the sense that they imbue other people and other people's minds and you know judgment with all this causal power. That the way that you make it in the world is you, you kind of you have to manipulate other people's minds in some way. And for Dominique, it's well, their minds are empty and uh, and blind, and they you know piss on anything good and holy, and so therefore because they make up the world, they make up, kind of, they set the boundaries on what's possible, the good can't survive, right? And for Wynand, it's, yeah, other people, they will piss on you if you let them, and they will destroy you if you let them, and you live in their world, right? Like, what you're able to do depends on who will hire you, and depends on who looks kindly upon you, and, you know, that you depend on people, fundamentally, to thrive and to, to live. And so therefore your choice is whether you let them piss on you or you piss on them in effect. But both of them are assuming that at this fundamental level, people run the world, that, that you know, other people's minds are ultimately what controls their fate. And Rourke doesn't think like that. For him, other people's minds are, are out there and his mind is in here and he's alone in his own mind and with his own judgment. So for him, when he values another person, it's not quite, you know, as like a source of validation that he's okay and he's gonna make it in the world. It's just, it's a, a source of value for him. It's like, I this is somebody I want in my world because they bring me joy or because they inspire me or because they get me, right? So the fact that Wynan gets him is, again, it's such a unique, spiritual value for Rourke. He's never really experienced it to that degree. Like he's never met an equal in that respect who kind of gets him at that level of kind of subtlety and depth and has so much in common with him at that kind of spiritual level that like he's willing to go to great lengths to support and champion and defend and spend time with that person. The fact that Wynan did all these things that made life harder for him, yeah, well, whatever, that's Wynan's problem. Like he even says that at one point, like you're trying to get my forgiveness, but it, it's not for me to forgive you. This isn't about me, this is about yourself, right? Like you're the one mad at yourself for putting me through the starter temple. I, the fundamental, like I never, I don't care. Like I just want to hang out with you <laughs> to put it in late terms. Yeah, I, I think again, um, Rorch just responds to the creative life force in Wynand the same way Dominique does. That simply it's it's more fully developed in Wynand than any other character in the universe yeah. of this story other than Rock himself. So it's understandable why both of them love Wynand in that way. What's interesting, I think, well, well it's all interesting, but another, you know, related to this is um, Dominique sees Wynand's gonna, moving towards some great disaster. And when uh, the Cortland dynamite occurs and Wynan defends Rourke in the banner. And of course he loses all his readership. He's losing money. Remember, remember Rourke tells him, he said, whatever it takes, he says, you know, do it, but don't give in. He said, don't give in. He keeps telling that, you know, don't give in. And you see what Rourke, Rourke's vision here. Wynan sold his soul for this yellow press scandal sheet. And therefore the exact price of reclaiming his soul has to be the entire empire that he sold it yeah. for. The paper, everything, the whole journalistic empire, he's, he's got to lose it all. And Rourke believes that Gail Winan now, yeah, that, that Gail Winan can recover from that loss. And now uh, with, that his own soul is, is uh, in charge. It's, and, you know, running the paper now, the paper now belongs to him. But Gail Winan, the independent man, even in his 50s, having lost everything, can start over again and be the man uh, he was meant to be. Remember what Dominique says. 
when Weinman's writing these brilliant editorials during the strike in defense of rock and in defense of great geniuses who've been pilloried by society. Dominique reads the editorials and she says to him, Gail, what a great journalist you could have been. You could have been. You'll, you'll read that and should have been. Gail Weinand in the field of journalism should be what Howard Rock is in architecture. Rock knows this, he sees it, he understands it. He wants Weinand to lose everything commercially, but reclaim his soul and then move and forward just from there. Can't. And Weinand yeah. just, I, one thing I would want to ask Ayn Rand, if I ever had a chance to sit down with her, is, is, is there limits to free will? I mean, to be is to be yeah. fine, right? Yeah. Weinand doesn't do it because he won't or because he can't. Yeah, this is uh, guess, a debate. Say, yeah, I guess Sorry. if she say that, that he won't, that, that he could, but ma makes a choice. But I don't, I can't put words in, in Ayn Rand's mouth. Anyway, it's right. brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. And of course, I notice last last point here, when Wyden won't see him anymore, you know, he he you know he 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 writes Rock writes him that letter that makes me just sob with tears every time, you know, I read it when he says, "Gail," he says, "I know," you know, <laughs> I understand. He said, if you come, he says, come, he says, come back. If you don't do it for yourself, do it for me. He said, you know, but that is, makes me cry even now. He said, he said, he said but, but come back. What you think you've lost, you know, you know, can never be, and why didn't, why won't even read the letter? Yeah. He's so shattered. Yeah. Well, you, it's really, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking. You're right, Josh. It's just absolutely heartbreaking. And that's, that's what I wanted to, to come to at the end of this is, um, sorry, plot spoilers for those of you who watched the film. In the film, Gail kills himself, but in the book he doesn't. And I wanted to just wonder. You know, this is this is kind of me wondering. And some, do you think there's any coming back for Gail at all psychologically? Would you, you know if you, some of that much. broken? <laughs> and I and, and I think and yeah, Gina, maybe yeah. starting with you. Yeah. So Andy, that question you just posed is a question that has fueled many debates and discussions that I've had with friends um, in especially given my loyalties as a therapist and my tendency to err on the side of assuming everybody can change and it's never too late even though clearly I know that that's not the case because you know I don't think like Hitler was redeemable at a certain point right and I don't think past a certain point of of existential you know, wickedness and a, a large enough scale of destruction. I don't think psychologically that there can be any coming back for some people, nor would I want to try to redeem them. Wynand for me is a real case example where, again, and you, you're right, we can't read her mind. You know, I wish I could ask her what she had in mind here, but as a kind of prototype for the kind of real life person I could imagine encountering in, a, you know, in my therapy practice, I keep thinking, you know what? I could have worked with him. I can see a way forward for him. And there are tools that we now have, but we, I mean, there, we now have therapeutic approaches. So Josh, obviously you're familiar with the DBT, for example, that has rehabilitated, you know, sometimes it, sex offenders and people who have committed real heinous crimes and who are able to at least reestablish some kind of productive role in the world and and what I've seen personally in my practice you know people who are able to come back from a lot of guilt and shame that's earned and so and at the same time my friends remind me this man has destroyed not just lives you know but he like he's uh what do you call it he's what's the the guy in the sopranos who runs a gang and he like he's a crime lord in effect and he has wrought real devastation and he has you know, destroyed some of the best people over the decades that he has been in charge you know, of this conglomerate and he's really 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 bad and yet i i, I don't think that i would write him off you know, if it, if it were me, if he were coming in, but then again, he'd have to come to see me, right? And I think fundamentally what Rand is, is signaling to us is he is already past redemption in his own, by his own lights, right? That, that he's kind of closed himself off to redemption. And, you know, so long as that's true, I don't think anyone coming in from, you know, if Rourke couldn't do it, I don't think, 
a therapist could, but whether, but to what extent that's a choice is the real question. Yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, I, mean, I, I think Walk is right. I think Wynand can redeem himself uh, even, even after the, um, you know, even after he, he turns on Rourke in the, during the, in the, uh, in the paper during the strike, even after the uh, started, uh, I mean, the Cortland trial, uh, that's why Rourke writes him that letter. I think, I think Rourke's right. I think Ayn Rand's shown us a choice, but I think Ayn Rand has shown us that he won't. He, I, I think he can. I think Rourke's right that he can. I, uh, I, I, and I, there is a point of no return. I remember, you know, many years ago, 1970s, when you know, I was in grad school, Leonard Kikoff was living in New York City, lecturing at the old Statler Hilton on 7th Avenue, writing the ominous parallels, talking about this issue. He said, well, where's the point you know, to be is to be finite, even for free will. Uh, where's the point of, of no return? Uh, is it the first murder? You know, he says, at a certain point, Hitler passed the point of no return. And there was just no, right. there was no, no redeeming himself. Now, Wynand, I don't think Wynand is that egregious. I don't think Wynand is that bad. I think he could. But, it's a judgment call. <laughs> yeah, right. It's enormously painful. He's lost the banner, his baby. He's lost Dominique. And he's like 50, right? He's well, some, yeah, somewhere he's in, in his 50s. 50s. Push him, push him, and, and what this, and he's in his 50s and everything that he thought he was working toward in life not only has been torn away from him and turned out to be worthless, it's turned out to be against him, right? right. It's turned out to be actively bad. And so what he would have to come back from is a complete loss of his existential self, right? Like he's I am lived, nobody right now. No, I have you're, done you're, nothing good and I have to start from scratch. You're right, Jim. He's lived, may not be alive, but he's lived an egregious era for his entire career. You know, for it like is 30, a lie. Whether I, he knows it or not, it's a lie. Yeah. And yeah. he's too smart not to know it, you know, to kind of okay. come back to the right, issue. Okay. I think it, you he's know. lived a lie anyway. his entire life. And then what he, what he thought he got out of it, this great success with the banner, he loses that. He loses Dominique. He's he, yeah. he's betrayed Rock and he knows he's betrayed Rock. It's a it's an enormous amount to ask, you know. Rock's asking him to uh, start over again at age fifty five or fifty eight, whatever he's from scratch, and then develop the newspaper that that wine and should have had paper that the New York Times claims to be. It is it. Yeah, New York Times is a yeah. dishonest leftist rag, but a serious paper with serious values. Wine and his own judgment rule in the paper. That's who wine and should have been. Rock thinks he still can do it. I think Rock's right, but it's a it's a I lot think it ask. really depends. And we can't know again in the novel there's no there's no truth of the matter because we only know what Rand yeah, is written. Why do we know we won't and, we know wine and chooses not to not to try. Yeah, well we know he doesn't, and we don't know what kind of choice he might have. But I think, you know, if if I were imagining a real life version of him, for example, if he had kids, I would raise the probability on, you know, can my likelihood estimate that he can turn it around and that he can still live some kind of a flourishing life with the years he has left. If he had kids, if he had some kind of, you know, even like if his art gallery were at, at stake, like if he knew that the art gallery is going to get blown up or, you know, get sold to the Keatings of the world once he ceases to, you know, some people like because of a dog that they love. That's why they choose to stick around, you know, and that's a stupid example. It would have to be something well, much grander something. than that for Wynand, but he needs value. Like he needs something right. to stick around right. for. Well, remember something, Gina, in a, in a way he does have kids. I remember the good things he does even at the end. Well, that's what I would remind him of in therapy. Yeah, that's exactly. why I think maybe I could have done it. If well, I, if I, I No, and I think, I think you could have. <laughs> remember, he, he shuts down the banner sooner than turn it over to Ellsworth Tui. And he hires Rourke to build the wine and building. There's still that spark. But he can't Rourke, right. face Rourke anymore. Well, that's, that's part of the issue. No, he won't. Well, he won't. He won't yeah. fan right. the he flames. Won't. So, yeah. and so he got so, he. So at the end of the novel, you're right, Josh. He's still alive, but morally, psychologically, he's he's finished. And, and that's, that's the, and, and I think that's that that brings us, you know, right to where I started. That heavy that heavy sadness that I. I introduced him with and I agree I agree with Gina that you know I think you know particularly these days and I think the wine and type is actually the mo most of all the characters in the novel Katie the Katie's and wine are who I get in my practice a lot and, yeah. and I've seen and I've seen amazing turnarounds um oh yeah especially I mean for the Katie's like if I could get Katie in my office 
you know, yeah. I'm but very confident wine, even, she could turn around. But, but yeah, earlier. The, the wine and the wine and types as well is is that they do come, they do come along, and you know, and um, but it is desperately tragic and it's it's desperately painful. Yeah. And I know some people say that you know when you do pop, cross that point of no return, your life you can't live your life anymore. I think part of what I, part of exactly part of what destroys wine and part of why he's so tragic is that it's the magnitude of his own ambition that destroys him because given that he signed himself onto this in fact evil aim right of creating and running this newspaper empire he succeeded on a really magnificent scale which means the damage he was able to do was magnificent right if he i get wine ends in my practice who are far lesser versions of wine end and that's partly why i think i can work with them because they haven't wrought the level of destruction that he had they haven't done anything particularly great either on anywhere close to that scale right but by the same token like they they haven't been able to do the kind of damage that he's able to do because they're not geniuses and they're not they don't have that kind of scope of ambition they're not operating on like a world changing history changing scale and i think that's part you know that's what makes him such a tragic hero it's what makes work loves love him and that's what makes him irredeemable in his own eyes ironically so the, again I want to thank both of you for fantastic discussion I, again i've learned so much um Likewise. I, I love Thank this you. novel. So. I love the characters in the novel. I love discussing it with you guys. I love the passion you bring to it. And um, yeah, I just want to thank you both for your time. Well, thank I had you a, and right back at you. <laughs> I had a great time. So I want to thank you, Josh and Rosie Ginsburg for setting this up. And uh, thank you, Gina, for the, you know, the uh, illuminating, illuminating discussions. But it, it's been a lot of fun. Likewise.